Everybody, it's Tyler here at Championships, checking with the legendary 118 Robonauts, who another phenomenal season from them. Eight blue banners, as well as the Impact Award at Texas Championships. So congratulations on all your success as well. What a phenomenal team they do, both in their Impact side and, of course, in their gorgeous robots as well, too. Lots to talk about in regards to 118, going from uh, machine learning, what they're covering for that. And, of course, we'll be following that full note journey through. This turret is absolutely incredible, and how they're doing their diversion and getting the notes in. Really great stuff that you need to pay attention to. So let's learn more about 118. Come up here on Behind the Bumpers. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Animark is your one-stop shop for all your robotics competition needs. Celebrating 20 years of quality robotics parts and superior service, Animark employees have over 200 years of first-team experience. From mechanical and electrical products to tools and hardware, head on over to Animark.com for high-quality and affordable solutions. Support funds content creators when you sign up for a membership on YouTube Join. You'll get access to special perks like emotes, loyalty badges, and fund members will even get early access to our scheduled videos and more. 100% of this revenue will go back to our correspondents to help recognize their efforts. Click the Join button in any YouTube video to pledge your support. Excuse me, let's go through your intake burst as we work through that note journey and it feeds in the turret. Talk me more about what this is as it works through your robot. Okay, so this right here is our spare intake. We have it out for you guys because it's pretty hard to see mounted underneath the bumpers and underneath the frame of our robot. So starting out here, we have this uh, wide front roller that fits right between our swerve modules. And the note hits this roller first and it goes inside through this path and we'll flip it underneath so you can see the set of rollers that we have. Um, so after it hits this roller and it goes up our Teflon coated dustpan, it hits these two um, powered black rollers that are spinning from um, th these bevel gears here. And then um, it funnels inside. These black, these black wheels squish the note into um, about eight inches in width and uh, the compression of our intake is also at about 1.9 inches. So it goes through there and then it passes into these passively spinning 3D printed rollers and it goes further in. And um, if we wanna show the belt side of our intake. So the entire intake is set up to have a system of belts that have that basically allow us to have these two counter-rotating elevator rollers in the middle. So we have one side of the intake belted together and another side of the intake belted together. And um, once the note travels through the intake and it hits this back roller, whatever is back based on what direction it's coming in on, it um, actually pops vertically up into a 90 degree position. And this was a huge uh, discovery for us um, as it leads into the intestines. So above these two elevator rollers, there are two more um, parallel rollers that are spinning with the turret. And we found that there's kind of like a magical number in between the elevator rollers on our intake and the rollers spinning with our turret that allow um, the note to touch those two rollers spinning with the turret and actually twist instead of um, and, and, and twist instead of just pass through in its normal orientation. So no matter what angle, no matter what rotation the turret is at, the note um, is taken in by the turret. When you're looking at approaching the game uh, in general for Crescendo, did you have to make any concessions in regards to having like that dual sided intake at all? Like did anything get left out by doing it or anything you had to majorly change in order to design that? Um, so actually we didn't enter the season thinking we would have a uh, dual sided intake, but as we were prototyping and designing our intake and we realized we had this system of belts, we kind of just figured that we could mirror it to the other side. And it was a pretty seamless design decision, especially because it's kind of of um, bringing our entire frame together as it goes from one side to the other and it, it integrated pretty easily. Awesome. So, Silas, talk to me more about the uh, integration as we go into the uh, turret and the shooter that you're doing as well too. Uh, you know, watching this on the field, you know, we you talked earlier three, where three, watching your robot, especially the last couple districts that you had, you were able to just pick up those four notes so quickly once you're amplified as well yep. too. I'd just love to hear Love more it. about that overall strategy as we dive more into what three, this three. is. Yeah, so very early on in the season when we did our strategic analysis, we found that the sort of ferrying and one cleanup robot strategy that has been playing out at a lot of events would be a really good strategy. And we decided we were going to go really heavily into that. And we found that in order to be able to clean up notes from that corner of the field really efficiently, a turret was going to be the best way for us to do that. So 
we immediately started working on developing the turret and in just a few days we found the, the sort of magic technology where you feed a node up into a pair of rollers that are just side by side and no matter what angle those rollers are at the note just twists straight through and so we we saw that and we ran with it on designing this shooter so designing the shooter packaging was was one of the hardest things for us just because it's such a big shooter and there's so many other mechanisms on this robot that it had to fit with so we we needed to get power up to the shooter so one of the big things is our energy chain solution where inside the robot, deep right above the intake, is actually a big planetary gearbox that runs our energy chain all the way around the robot. So it moves half a rotation when the shooter goes 360. And that was, that was one big patch, packaging thing. And then the other thing was we found that with the two rollers, two rollers side by side, feeding that into the shooter, we'd end up with a very bent note. And all of our prototyping on actually shooting notes showed that bent notes just did not leave the robot very cleanly. So we put a lot of effort into making sure the note was as straight as possible when it was rested in the shooter such that our shots were gonna be powerful and consistent. So the way we did that is we use a bunch of passive rollers inside the shooter. So we've got a bunch of passive rollers and so being sent up from the intake, it doesn't hit anything active until the very top of the shooter, it hits the passive rollers first and those are what initiate the twist such that the note gets compressed sideways and it slips on the passive rollers and twists into the shooter. Something I want to ask you in regards to like your uh, wheel config that you have here as well too, does this change over time at all in regards to uh, your different types of wheels or the compression or anything like that? Yeah, so this is actually an entirely different shooter than the original one we had sure. in that We've always had the uh, approximately two inch wheels with independent speeds, but originally it was, we thought we were gonna need a ton of inertia in the system to get a bunch of notes out really fast. So behind these motors was actually a set of inertia wheels, brass inertia wheels that were laid down a little bit for weight, but we found that the belt runs and all of that was just a little bit inefficient and it caused our shooter to draw a lot of current, which slowed us down on the field. And so between Tulsa and Tallahassee, we rebuilt the whole shooter from the ground up and came to this design where we have just one big gear in the back that transmits power to both sides. So we have that on each side. So we get, we're able to control the spin of the note based on how much spin we want for a shot and what alliance color we are. Cause you want different, we found we wanted different spin on different alliances. Yeah, Jackie, let's go into your diverter mechanism. What's going on in that? How it integrates in regards to your trap scoring? Of course, I'd love to take a look at your climber too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So our diverter, we call it a diverter because it takes a note from the shooter and diverts it into the amp. So uh, Paul's gonna demonstrate how it works. So the pitch is gonna move up first and then, pitch is gonna move up first to get in the trap position. Yeah, the intakes. And then this is our amp position for our shooter. And then we deploy our diverter. And then when we hit the shoot button, it just all one smooth motion goes down into the amp. Um, so looking at the mechanism here, um, we chose to squish the note down further um, so that we have more tolerance left and right uh, for missing the note um, or for not missing the amp. Um, and we also use, utilize this uh, gear cluster. It's all 3D printed. White gears are PETG, uh, blacks are Onyx, um, and then they are they all have bearings that have extended rim, uh, ex extended ring, so that it's super uh, easy to assemble a swap out. Although we've never had to uh, swap one out, surprisingly, um, and that is to save width um, instead of using belts. Um, it saves a lot of width, and then we are able to design this whole mechanism within uh, just an extra inch of uh, width that we're not using. And we also go uh, do this custom sheet metal structure that goes, hugs around the shooter. Um, and then we have this Kraken that powers it that is also structural. Um, so we mount the polycarb to the Kraken and then the clamp the Kraken down. So I guess, you know, saves weight. Um, and then here we have these uh, custom, or Vex sprockets that we custom uh, lightened and anodized. And then some, some, uh, this is a originally designed for a can coder with a stainless steel part that has a drilled 
hole for a magnet and then rat rings. And then this is a custom cover for the uh, can coder that no longer exists because we now uh, have these rests that we go to zero on every time we, we uh, start of the match. And then that brings us to the gearbox here. That custom gearbox is for the diverter deploy. They are just regular VEX gears that we have water jetted the triangles out of and took a uh, three-quarter end mill, a uh, ball end end mill on a rotary table uh, just to you know make it a little bit lighter. Um, and then, yeah, that's uh, this is also the same mechanism we use for our trap uh, as well because our climb gets us to the height uh, we need to match the amp and trap to use the same mechanism. So, so this kind of opens the door for trap as well. So that's another advantage. Yeah. How's your climber work itself? Like what's yeah. that deployment yeah, look yeah. like? So our climber, so we have these hooks on the end of the wheels that are driven by these uh, custom gearbox powered by a crack in here. Um, and then this jack shaft that runs all the way across with a ratchet on the other end. Um, so here, uh, Paul's gonna deploy the skis um, and then So you'll see here, the torsion springs uh, make it lock on in its over centers. And then that, you know, um, the jack shaft is uh, like acting as a pivot as well. Um, and then this is our first step of climbing. As After we line up, we deploy our chain arms, which Paul's gonna do here in a second. Um, chain arm. Okay, so um, this mechanism this, this uh, little roller sits in this rail right here. That's how it stays stowed. And then there's a cam here that before it was stowed um, would kind of lift it up so that it has some sort of leverage. Um, it's in such a geometry where it deploys faster than it climbs such that um, we don't do anything fancy for a deploy. We just kind of uh, winch it up. And then there's also a little locking mechanism, which I think is possibly the coolest part. Um, there's a little clip in here and then it locks in. And then, um, yeah, and then we have a custom gearbox as well um, that's you know, kind of hidden away, but it's uh, really deep in the robot, like an inch off the floor. Um, and then there's a jack shaft that runs all the way across so that it ensures these two are lined up. Um, and then custom uh, printed spool. And, uh, oh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much how we climb, yeah. Well, we got to talk about software on the robot too, and what's gone into it. Robonauts, you know, I think a lot of people see the aesthetics, they see the uh, great uh, side of the mechanical side, but they don't always hear about the software that goes into it. So I'd love to dive more about into it, Paul. Talk to me more about what you're utilizing for software and how that's breaking it down. Uh, yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so on this robot, we have four different cameras, um, uh, and we started planning our vision system kind of into the robot from the very beginning. Um, here, this is the regular Limelight 3, which we use for tracking the speaker at a high frame rate. Um, this is what allows us to track with the turret independent of the base quickly, keeping up with that rotation. Um, this Limelight 3G is used solely for its localization. Uh, that allows us to use a higher um, resolution and a lower frame rate, which gives us a better localization across the field while we're doing ferry shots, um, and we can use our button pad to select a number of different points on the field where we want to place notes by ferrying. Um, we've also got two limelights on either side of the robot uh, with the intakes and these are used uh, for tracking notes. They run a, a machine learning neural network model um, to detect them and primarily in Auton we um, drive the robot based off of the um, the stream off of that so that it can correct its course and uh, be more robust against various um, right, failures like that, slipping so. odometry and um, the notes getting moved around by other robots and things. Um, so that's been a really uh, unique part of our robot this year that we've uh, enjoyed seeing play out. Last thing I just want to ask you before we wrap up here, as you're approaching championships, with autonomous modes changing so much that we've seen here, any major changes for Robonauts as you approach autonomous? Did you uh, did you implement anything during uh, your quals matches that were maybe different from uh, DCMP? Um, well, we haven't had a, done a whole lot of development here at Worlds, but we did take the week uh, between State and Worlds, and we added three new Autons, um, all of which solely use the note tracking. Uh, and we like to end our Autons by kind of letting our robot a little bit looser um, and just kind of telling it 
uh, drive, and if you see a note, shoot it. And that's led to some more interesting behavior. Um, it's gotten its own rebound sometimes. It's gotten other, no other, um, other notes that just happen to be on the field in a place. Um, and so that's been exciting to see. Yeah, that's a cool outcome, right, for it, for sure. Well, Robots, thank you so much for taking time to tell us more about your team uh, this year. Phenomenal machine once again, and the incredible impact your team continues to do throughout the first community from every bot to everything else you do is so cool. So thanks a lot. Good luck here at the rest of the championships, and can't wait to see how you do. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Animark is your one-stop shop for all your robotics competition needs. Celebrating 20 years of quality robotics parts and superior service, Animark employees have over 200 years of first-team experience. From mechanical and electrical products to tools and hardware, head on over to Animark.com for high-quality and affordable solutions.